Hello everybody, um, today we're going to discuss about uh, the integration of JavaScript into the browser. So uh, uh, up to now uh, we discussed a bit uh, the JavaScript language uh, on one side, on the other side we discussed the um, structure of the browser with the HTML and uh, CSS uh, languages and now we're trying to uh, do the first step to mix uh, everything together and uh, uh, integrate uh, finally our JavaScript code into the browser environment and uh, um, this is going to be more or less the, the schedule or the outline of this uh, uh, lecture uh, we'll uh, start by seeing how to load the javascript code into the browser and then try to understand what are the objects uh, that are available to our javascript code while it's running in the browser and how to create dynamic behaviors uh, through uh, event handling procedures so let's start uh, with the easy part, which is uh, uh, download, uh, loading uh, uh, JavaScript in the browser. So basically, uh, you, you need, uh, we need to, uh, to uh, tell to the browser that a given HTML page needs uh, to be um, uh, powered by, by an external uh, file, uh, an external JavaScript file that should be included into the page. So actually, there's no, uh, uh, we don't have a command for loading HTML into the browser we have a command for loading the JavaScript into the HTML page. Mm -hmm. uh, so inside an HTML document, the document itself with the tag which is called the script uh, will include uh, some JavaScript code and the browser uh, will uh, uh, be able to, um, uh, to uh, develop, uh, um, to, to include uh, the, the, and execute uh, the code that is in inserted there. Uh, there are two ways of doing that. So, uh, one is uh, using the script uh, tag for including an inline fragment of, uh, of uh, JavaScript. Like in this way, we have a, a given page uh, with a script tag and inside the script tag, instead of having normal text, uh, we have JavaScript code. And the other case, uh, which is the normal one, is including an external file with the source attributes uh, uh, telling where to find the script uh, that could be in the same server or in some cases also in external servers uh, when some conditions uh, are met and we'll see that in detail in the future. Uh, so uh, inline JavaScript uh, is, um, uh, is not very much used and not very much uh, recommended uh, because actually when the browser is loading the page and it gets to a script element uh, it just stops uh, loading the page, starts ex executing the script, uh, and then we'll continue later to, um, to execute it, uh, to load the page and, and build uh, the rest of the page. Um, what happens also is that the, if uh, the script element will generate some, some output, well, this output will be included into the page instead of, uh, uh, of the initial script tag. Uh, this is not... Mm, I'm not rec I'm recommending never using that because uh, uh, it's, uh, it includes snippets, small snippets of code uh, here and there into the HTML document that become uh, very uh, difficult to maintain uh, and very difficult to, to, to understand also to follow the, uh, the, the logic of the page. The real solution is to create an external file uh, and um, uh, define in the, the external file all the JavaScript code and just include it uh, into your page. What happens at this point is that uh, one, when the browser will find uh, the script element uh, while loading the HTML page, it will stop for a moment, uh, uh, load the uh, JavaScript file, uh, execute the JavaScript file and then continue. Um, normally, uh, this JavaScript file will contain a set of uh, function definitions or object definitions, will not contain anything that will uh, modify the page itself, hmm? but we'll see the, the best practices later. Um, actually, uh, we, we, we may put the script tab, tag whenever, wherever we want into an HTML page, uh, because the script will just be executed uh, where, when it's found, so as, as long as it's found, as soon as it's found, uh, it will be executed. And there are, uh, say, if you look at the textbook solution, they in many cases they suggest uh, uh, that the script tab um, belongs to the head of the document. So they suggest you to put the script, uh, uh, loading script, uh, when you are also loading uh, style sheets, when you are also defining metadata for the document, and so on. And from a logical point of view, it's okay. Uh, but the problem is that from the performance point of view, it's very bad. 
is very bad and inefficient because actually all the loading of the page all the body of the page uh, that will contain the text uh, the images and everything else uh, will be delayed until the script is loaded and executed hmm? and so uh, the loading of the page is slowed down very much and the user will find will see a page that is stuck during the loading so you open a website you find a, a blank page and only after a while the content will start to appear we want to avoid that and so the suggestion is to have uh, the script tag just before the end of the document so it should be the last tags uh, the last element before the closing body the closing body body close and uh, uh, at this point uh, the browser will uh, already load all the html document and so it can start uh, loading the images formatting the page uh, applying the style sheets and so on and so the user will have something visible hmm, to, to, to interact with and uh, uh, while the browser is doing that then only at that point the script uh, is going to be uh, loaded and uh, and um, and executed hmm? but there was, there's already something on the screen so it's more efficient in this way uh, especially for the perceptive point of view from the user the other reason is that uh, if you have the script at the beginning then the JavaScript is executed when no document exists uh, yet. Nobody is, is loaded yet. So the script will only have, uh, will live, will be born into an empty page. So it cannot do anything useful at the moment. It may also, it may also do it later with, uh, with the scheduled events. In the, uh, on the other hand, if you are here at the end, when the script is, ex is executed, all the body is already loaded so the javascript will already be able immediately to interact with the content of the page hmm? uh, at the end of this presentation in the performance tip section we'll see some uh, better ways of doing that so these are the classical ways uh, uh, i am already telling you that the, the solution will be a, a, a third one not one of these two uh, but we first need to understand a lot of stuff uh, in order to appreciate what will happen in the in the by, by taking into account uh, the performance and having the, the best of the two worlds. Hmm? Okay, so uh, we decide we de we instructed the browser to load our code, and where does this code go? The code goes inside the, the browser, and uh, the browser will uh, run it in a specific sandbox. So it's a it's a restricted environment. Uh, where only some uh, objects, some operations are possible because the, the browser will control exactly what kind of uh, information our JavaScript code will uh, have access to. Uh, basically, uh, e the code will be executed by attaching it to a, to a global object, so every JavaScript code will uh, uh, execute in a global environment. When uh, we were working on Node.js, uh, the global environment was uh, Node.js itself, and uh, it uh, gave us a, a global object that was called global uh, while in the browser the, the 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 environment the runtime environment is the browser itself and so the global object is called window mm -hmm. so uh, there is a one object which is predefined for every javascript code is called window and it refers to the window in which the html page uh, that contains the javascript code is running mm -hmm. that is a shared global context and uh, aside from the, uh, through the window, uh, the, the only uh, say object or information that, that our JavaScript code will see are the attributes uh, and the methods offered by the window. And in, in particular, uh, the window global scope uh, will, of course, include all the JavaScript standard library. So everything we learned about uh, um, JavaScript functions and objects uh, is, uh, is, of course, uh, included and uh, offered by the uh, window object and uh, we'll also offer two different uh, sets of uh, uh, apis set of interfaces uh, one are for controlling and interacting with the browser so called the browser object model and the other the most important one is for interacting with the document itself so the document object model if you are loading many documents many scripts in the same html which is possible uh, they behave as different programs uh, but they share the same global scope so actually they might communicate by setting reading and writing variables in the browser in the global scope which means uh, by adding or modifying uh, properties of the window object uh, which is a very crude way of, of interacting and not very nice having different programs that share a global space and this, uh, all, all the risks 
of, uh, of um, overwriting a variable and uh, that's why some more sophisticated mechanism like modules uh, has been developed in order to be able to load different libraries in an ordered way without uh, each one of them uh, overwriting the others okay we'll see uh, how models are implemented in a future class because uh, there's a difference between the uh, node implementation and the browser implementation of modules uh, even if they are converging right now they're still quite different so for the moment we'll only start uh, by thinking about one single script we are only focusing on one single script for the moment okay so if we want to put uh, uh, these in, uh, in the picture so recall the picture of the last classes uh, we see that our javascript is interacting with the layout engine through the dom as and is also interacting directly with the browser itself uh, through the so-called bom uh, browser object module and the interaction of uh, uh, with the with the api libraries all, all of them both the dom and the bom uh, are uh, asynchronous interfaces so all the interaction most of the interaction will happen asynchronously uh, through a set of events uh, that are generated processed uh, exchanged and so on between our script and the libraries uh, we see a lot about events in the second half of this presentation but for the now now we just understand uh, uh, we just need to understand that uh, events are generated uh, by uh, many sources it may be user user generated uh, event generated by user, user actions or by network actions or by timing issues and so on but once events are, are generated they are handled they can be handled by the browser itself so by with some predefined behaviors for example if i click on a link then the browser will lead me to another page so the action associated with clicking the link is an action that is managed, handled by the browser itself. Or we may have uh, some actions defined uh, by, by us, by our code. We can attach event handlers in our JavaScript code. Mm -hmm. So we can decide which JavaScript function will be called when a specific event, uh, event happens on a specific element. Or by default, uh, events are ignored. So in, a, in every second of execution of a web page, uh, there are probably thousands of events uh, that are generated every time the mouse moves uh, or, uh, or uh, anything happens will generate an event and most of these events are just ignored. So the, the engine will act like these events were uh, actually running, but only the ones that need to be handled are really considered. So most of them are lost, it's not a problem to lose events, uh, uh, what we only what we want to do is to identify those behaviors those events that we want to manage because uh, there's a, a reaction that we need to provide uh, to that uh, specific events uh, this is a, is a very nice asynchronous description uh, of uh, events that happen that are exchanged uh, as i said uh, we will see the details later but the problem is that javascript is not asynchronous at all so we have a programming model which is highly asynchronous by the, but the engine, by the JavaScript engine, is single-threaded. So actually, it's a synchronous interpreter. It executes one instruction after the other, and uh, as you probably recall from, from the first labs, uh, um, if you are stuck in a loop uh, doing some computation, then nothing asynchronous may happen, because there's only one thread which is executing the main program. And so how to uh, simulate or manage the asynchronicity of events uh, within a synchronous environment well the solution is to uh, manage a so-called event loop that uh, will enqueue all the events and will dequeue and process them uh, when the time is, is come uh, and when the main thread is free from other computations so actually uh, we have a so-called message queue where all the events are just lined up uh, and they uh, and only when the the main thread is idle so the main program doesn't have anything else to do uh, then the, the javascript interpreter will just pull the message queue to check whether there is any um, any pending message any pending message that will contain a pending event that will need to be managed at that point that event will be picked from the queue and uh, uh, processed and executed and while this event handler uh, is executing no other events uh, uh, may uh, be executed in parallel so they need to wait until the completion of the first one hmm? 
so uh, graphically uh, we can see uh, this picture that uh, hints us that at the javascript environment where we have our javascript code we have our sandbox that doesn't allow us to do anything outside our code and in the in, in our environment we have uh, the the memory heap so the part of the memory that will contain our objects uh, with their properties and so on so every every time we create an object an array a function it will end up in this area of memory and uh, on the right uh, we have the call stack uh, which is the uh, stru uh, the data structure that will remember all the currently running functions so if i have a function a that calls a function b that calls a function c then we will have a stack with the function c on top because because the currently executing one and then we have function b which is waiting below and uh, the execution of b will only uh, continue when c will be finished when, when c returns and so we have a calls b and calls c c is executing then c will return so the execution will go back to b and then when b returns the execution will go back to a and as long as there is something in the call stack the browser will uh, execute those so if i have one function call in the call stack which is currently currently executing that may call other functions they will execute take over the cpu and then they will return and until the last one uh, will return which is the first one that was called has finished their job uh, the control the execution control will be on the code which is currently executing and uh, this code probably may generate uh, some events uh, so might add some events uh, may, may schedule some activities and all these events new events and activities will be queued will be added on this uh, uh, queue of callbacks uh, or of messages or events uh, it has di different names uh, in different documents um, and so they are being just added here and making this queue longer and longer only when the call stack is empty then we can pull a, a first element from the event loop and put it onto a call stack so right now we are calling uh, we are executing the uh, event lender for on click we put it on the call stack and we start executing that and if this uh, event lender uh, is uh, calling other functions well they just will pile up uh, on top of them and uh, and behave normally as the main thread basically so um, the the idea is that uh, uh, whenever we call a new function this function is pushed to the call stack whenever we schedule an event for example with a set timer the event uh, will put uh, will be put in the message queue so let's like call a scheduling an event is like calling a function but later hmm? uh, scheduling the function to be executed later uh, of course uh, uh, these uh, scheduling events may happen in our code so we may explicitly set an, an event for the future or very uh, much uh, uh, more often uh, those events uh, will be generated by external events external uh, happenings like user actions uh, the user is moving the mouse for example the input output operation is completed or generates an error uh, the network uh, is uh, disconnected or connected uh, we schedule some timer and so on mm -hmm. so all of these external uh, events uh, will add uh, uh, of course a new um, new uh, elements here in this in this queue so when the main thread is uh, finished we will have here a mixture of events that we have scheduled for ourselves and other events that came from other uh, from external sources let's say and so at any step the javascript interpreter if the call stack is not empty it's already running something then execute it execute what's already in the call stack only if the call stack is empty then we may pick the head of the message queue and start executing it we'll see some one exception to this rule uh, when dealing with promises which basically have in some cases a priority which is higher to the call stack functions but uh, um, we'll, we'll see them in the in the, in the that other context but in general the mechanism is only uh, of executing one function at a time and check this function which function to be executed will be taken from the call stack or from the queue depending on which one is empty um, this also means that every function as soon as it's called it will also always run to completion 
so it's not possible to suspend the function execution uh, or something like that and so we must be careful to return quickly uh, whenever we are executing a code from an event handler uh, all the other event handlers are blocked are waiting so if we take a, too much time to uh, you know, process a click event or a mouse, mouse move event, uh, all the JavaScript uh, execution, all the other elements in the page will be blocked until this uh, specific function will return. So we should be very, very careful that all our event handlers, especially the event handlers, uh, will run very fast, hmm? will return immediately. If possible, trying to delay something, to, to reschedule something for the future, but the synchronous execution should be as fast as possible because there's no other way by which other event tenders that may also have a, a hypothetically a higher priority but they cannot interrupt interrupt the current executing uh, function ever okay so this is the basis for the execution uh, and we'll see that uh, all these apis will try to exploit this uh, this basic uh, execution model uh, the easy part uh, of the uh, APIs offered to our JavaScript code is the, the so-called uh, browser object model. Uh, it's a bit of a strange name uh, um, and it's also not standardized. There's no standard document that prescribes uh, which effect, which object, sorry, the browser will uh, um, offer to the JavaScript code. There's no, a no a formal standard, but actually there's a a large agreement between the different browser vendors that tend to offer uh, more or less the same objects with more or less the same functionality so we can describe that as it were a, a, a generic api even if there are differences between the browser and browser and uh, uh, basically the, the the browser object model contains the window object which is the mother or father of all the other objects and that will uh, in, uh, link uh, as a properties we'll have some properties that correspond to other internal objects uh, that uh, enable you to interact with, with different parts uh, uh, of the browser itself mm -hmm. and then we have the document object which is part of the dom so it's, uh, it relates to the document and not to the browser itself um, again uh, the global scope uh, is uh, the window object and uh, since it's the global object uh, uh, it, it, has, uh, it has some uh, special scoping property so every property of window is also visible globally so if i say window dot my program or if I, if I say my program is the same variable so every time i use a global name in my code for example with a var outside any function uh, i'm referring to a global variable and this global variable is stored as a property of window and also on the other hand every property of window is also immediately available as a global variable so technically the dom will start uh, with the property document of object window so the right name of the of the document part will be window dot document but we may also use just document because every property of window is also automatically pushed to the global scope so this name document is the same uh, as the property document of the window object mm -hmm. and uh, this also means that every time we create a global name uh, it will be pushed to the window object and every other script in the page that try to store something in the global object will see the variable and we just should hope very strongly that uh, every script will use different variable names otherwise uh, we are creating chaos in our program so which are the most important uh, or most uh, popular uh, uh, properties of window uh, console you remember the console.log statement uh, gives you access to the functions of the browser console mm -hmm. and so uh, while node.js console was linked to the terminal in which node was running uh, in this case console is linked uh, to the um, to the to the developer tools of our browser so normally they are hidden but when you're developing it will log into a, a text area uh, log is the easiest method of this uh, object we'll document we'll discuss it later when we talk about the dom history gives you access to the api of the browser so can, we can, you can tell which are, which were the previous page visited you can ask uh, the browser to go back to the previous page and so on 
so you are controlling the forward and backward buttons of the browser in some way location corresponds to the url of, of the of the browser so whatever is in the location bar of the browser is accessible through this object so you can uh, check the current location or you can set a new value and it will trigger the browser into loading a new page so the way you can load a new page is just setting window.location equal to a new url and then the browser will immediately go there and also there are uh, some objects that will help you storing some information in the browser mm -hmm. so the browser can also store of course you should be careful not uh, uh, storing megabytes and megabytes of information but some information that you may use uh, uh, to help uh, your application uh, remember data uh, there's a local storage and uh, a, a session storage so the local storage is stored into the browser itself uh, forever and the session storage will only be stored until the current tab uh, closes and we'll see some more detail uh, of this so these are the main methods that you, you can see in 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 the code uh, that in, in other job another people javascript code uh, there's also a screen object that will uh, give you the physical measures of the window in which uh, uh, the, the application is running your web page is running um, and uh, all the navigator object will give you all the information about the current software uh, the browser software or the versions and so on and uh, and we have also some attributes of all window uh, you know you remember the set, the set timeout or set interval functions well they uh, they are actually properties of the window so it's window dot set interval that we used uh, normally without qualifications uh, uh, because it was a global uh, object so there are also properties uh, of window uh, the window object itself uh, has also some uh, other methods that are used to to create uh, alerts uh, or confirmation dialogues and so on but they are not to be used uh, except for debugging okay because usually the, the user interface should be generated in html and not using uh, the browser model pop-ups but when debugging it may be useful uh, all the timing uh, 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 instructions uh, scheduling instructions are here uh, set immediate is, uh, is equ equivalent to set interval uh, so to set timeout with a timeout of zero so it means uh, as soon as possible schedule for now event listeners uh, are uh, basic methods that uh, will uh, mm, allow us to define our own event in, event listeners uh, event handlers uh, for different kinds of events we'll see them when we discuss uh, the events and there are a lot of other um, methods which is, are easy to understand to control the browser and the environment so this uh, applies to everything in the browser except the web page uh, we, I mentioned briefly the, the, the storage uh, and so uh, we, we, you, you can see that we have a, a couple of uh, different uh, uh, properties one is called local storage and the other is called session storage they behave like uh, arrays mm -hmm. so uh, you may have local storage and store some according to some name some key like uh, associative arrays uh, um, and you can uh, set some properties inside so imagine this um, as free objects where you can store any property you want the difference between local storage is that uh, it doesn't expire uh, and so it's uh, it's uh, it stays in the browsers and when you when your page will be loaded tomorrow in two days and three days you will find your data there while session storage will be destroyed when the browser is closed or when the tab is browsed is closed so it's only you can use it for uh, short-lived information something that you don't need to remember for long okay so these are the basic uh, environment thing that the window will provide you and the most important part of course is the document itself hmm, where we see the content of the page uh, the document object model is, uh, is a standard uh, definition uh, we it started uh, a long time ago when uh, we switched from HTML 3 to 4 that it, and JavaScript was becoming very common and popular and so there, um, they, we had the need of, uh, of defining a standard way for JavaScript to interact with the web page and in 1988 it was uh, um, say, uh, published uh, for the first time uh, uh, by the W3C um, and uh, of course there was some some evolution across the years uh, 
and more or less trying to follow what happened at the HTML language. So uh, level two introduces CSS and uh, level three introduces uh, the XHTML, which is now more or less forgotten and so on. And right now, like the rest of the HTML specification and the rest of the CSS specification, the DOM is called a living standard. So it's something that will be continuously updated and uh, you only have the la latest version to work with and a different level of support by different browsers, mm -hmm. like all the other uh, three major definitions. So right now we have uh, uh, HTML, we call it HTML5, but it's continuously changing. CSS, we call it CSS3, but it's continuously changing. And so the, the individual modules are, are evolving and also for the DOM, which is tracking uh, the, uh, the HTML and the CSS specifications and try to offer them into an object format. Uh, we already know that the DOM is actually a tree representation that starts from the parsing of the, of the HTML source and it generates a tree structure. But it will also start with the with a root element, uh, which is called, H with a document, will point to an uh, initial element, which is uh, HTML, and then we have the body and all the content, content of the body. So we have a, a standard interface for representing these kind of trees and for interacting with these kind of trees. Uh, if we want to uh, see something more, we can have some visualization tools like for example there's a website here where you can paste some html code and will show you the tree structure of the of the html uh, of the dom so uh, every every line will be a different dom node in the tree and the uh, name of this node is a, is a type of element a type of tag that is generating that so you can just paste some code here and see the corresponding dom in the in the in the window below or more easily you can just open the browser uh, developer toolbox in your browser and see uh, in real time what is the content of your current document so you you remember uh, the this this page that we developed together uh, last time uh, you can just fire up the the, the, the developer tools and uh, you can see all the uh, notes so every line here is a, a node of the dom and uh, and we use this uh, also to inspect uh, and to understand what's happening so it looks like the html source but it's actually there are nodes in the dom that uh, are just uh, printed and displayed like uh, like the corresponding html code and we can see here the nesting uh, the three level nesting of the different uh, uh, nodes and attributes so we see really the the, the shape of the tree that will uh, that is currently matched uh, like that like it's uh, highlighting different parts of the page uh, according to which part of the tree i'm selecting right now mm -hmm. and of course it works also the other way around so if we try to select uh, for example this table cell it will immediately highlight uh, in the dom uh, the the corresponding part of the code mm -hmm. um, so these are the, the tools that we are going to use uh, and so JavaScript uh, tr uh, will have access to the content of the DOM and to a set of methods uh, that the, the DOM API offers uh, that will uh, allow JavaScript to do practically everything, mm, practically everything with this uh, uh, tree of information. So we can check the page structure, we can find elements, we can modify elements, we can uh, uh, create elements, we can... Uh, uh, change the attributes uh, and so on and last but not least we can uh, control the event listeners to uh, dynamically change the behavior of the page um, first of all it's a it's a it's an object model so the question is what are the kinds of uh, objects that compose this tree uh, are all these nodes uh, or all the all the tree of the same type or not well actually no uh, there is there are different uh, types of nodes the most important one is a document node which is window.document which is only one at the beginning so it will start of all the model of every dom will start with a document node then we have uh, many uh, elements that correspond to html tags and they, they are uh, uh, objects of class element of type element uh, so you see html is an element body is an element a is an element and so on but uh, the HTML source is not just made of elements, it's also made of attributes and text. So attributes are stored by a different kind of node, which is called attr. 
like this an attribute value uh, so the, we have the attribute name and the attribute value and, and text uh, is stored in a different type of node uh, which is a text node in this, uh, in this case here mm -hmm. uh, we may also have uh, comments and document declaration but we do usually don't care about those so these are the type of nodes that compose uh, our uh, our tree this is the inheritance uh, uh, picture that says that uh, a node may be a text node may be an element node and may be a comment and uh, an element normally is an html element it may also be something else but basically when we are talking about elements we are talking about html elements that correspond to html tags and they differ in this uh, node type uh, uh, attribute that will make them different so especially we have elements and text uh, attributes are separate are not uh, are not elements but they are a separate type of, of, of objects uh, we see that on the top that all nodes are also event targets uh, so there are uh, possible items that may generate events mm -hmm. we'll check it later uh, another data structure that we should be familiar with uh, in the dom is the node list structure structure so uh, in many many methods for the dom api will return or, or will require a list of nodes mm -hmm. a list of nodes here maybe a list of elements uh, usually or a, a list of a mixture of elements and text mm -hmm. this kind of list uh, is called a node list we don't use a normal array for storing this element uh, you use a special data type which more or less behaves like an array uh, in some cases uh, it's only it's a read-only data structure so you should not add uh, we cannot add or, or remove elements for this uh, data structure because it will refer to the actual elements on the page but apart from the special type uh, so if you see node list you just in your mind read an array of nodes hmm? which has more or less uh, uh, the same proper the same basic property of, of array and if you want you may also be converted to an array to use also the other functional properties if you want um, okay so this is the basic the objects and uh, the basic objects uh, element attribute and node list and uh, let's see how to work with those first of all uh, imagine you are in a javascript code and you want to do something with a with an element of the page the first issue is to find it hmm? so for example in our inspector here uh, i want to change the score for example okay this one uh, and so i could change the text inside this td element easy to do but how do i find this td element so i should be able to find it somewhere in the page and uh, um, uh i i have i am inside a javascript program that needs to navigate in this tree in order to find uh, a given element hmm? uh, so there are a lot of methods that will uh, will, uh, will help us to find elements i can find an element if i know its id if this element has an id i can i can use this id and try to find the, the element and so I will have the finding an element means uh, having the the reference to the to the object. So every element element is a node. Node is an object. So I can have the reference to the object that describes that specific table data or that, that that specific part of the page. So once I have the object, I can do whatever I want with the properties of, the, of that object. We'll see it later. Hmm? So first of all, we need to find the element. We find we we may find it if I know the ID. If I know the tag name or the class name, for example, the element that a class equal to you know column eight or a tag name that is called div, uh, the difference that you find is that get element by id is singular element, and while searching for tag name or class is plural elements here elements there. Of course, because uh, there is only one element that may have a given id, and while there may be many elements with the same tag name so many div in the page or many elements that uh, are um, tagged with the same class mm -hmm. so at that point uh, uh, we these methods will return a node list uh, while the first method will return just a single node mm -hmm. of course um, 
and there are other methods which are a bit more powerful uh, they are called uh, a query selector uh, that will return then uh, accept a parameter of type css selector so if you are able to write a css query for finding an element you can pass the same css syntax uh, here as a string uh, and uh, uh, the, the query selector will find uh, those elements uh, uh, that uh, match uh, the um, the CSS expression mm -hmm. so it's useful because it's the same CSS that we are using to to program the layout of the element we can use them also to um, um, uh, to, to use them in to find the elements in JavaScript to identify the objects in JavaScript the difference between these two methods if uh, are that uh, the second one will return a node list with all the matching nodes uh, and the first one will only return the first uh, element uh, here the first element that will match the selector syntax so if you know that there will only be one or you only care about the first uh, then it will be a possibility um, okay um, by the way all these methods that here are described to be applied on the document object they will also work if you apply them on any element node so you can ask a given element to uh, to find an element by id or by tag name and so on and if the method is called on a node instead of the document it will only work on the descendant element so on the subtree that is rooted on that specific node so we can find the first element and then do a second search to refine the search only inside the, the scope of the first one for example um, so for example let's try to to play a bit with the with the with the dom uh, representation in the in the browser hmm? so just to familiarize ourselves with these methods uh, what you could do what we could do is to write some javascript code here in the console hmm? or uh, there's also a possibility of splitting the screen in the dom part uh, on the top and the console in the bottom so you can see both uh, at the same time so the screen space is precious in this case but we can do that um, so for example uh, uh, here in the console uh, we have a JavaScript interpreter of course we can write our own JavaScript code so I can write for example document and will give me uh, will print me the representation of this document so this is the root of the DOM the document object and if I open that I will see all the properties of this object so this is very useful because it will inspect uh, all the properties of a given object and so if i want uh, i should i could be able to find uh, uh, the i don't know the um, the title here hmm? so the title i know that is inside uh, uh, a jumbotron element uh, and instead of that we have an h1 element hmm? so what i could find uh, is uh, for example document dot uh, uh, get elements by uh, tag name h1 so give me all the h1 elements and will give me a html collection which is a not list uh, of length one because i know that in this page is only one h1 element and this collection will have uh, two elements oh sorry one element which is this h1 node so I can remember this node, let title, let title equal to document dot get element by uh, class uh, by tag name of h1. Maybe let me increase the, the zoom. Get element by tag name h1 dot the uh, index zero. So the first element. So in this case, title will be the H1 that contains the text. You see that this node has many properties, and these are all the properties of this DOM node. You see all, all kinds of properties. We'll see. We'll uh, study the, the most important ones uh, that uh, uh, represent uh, all the layouts, all the connectivity, and so on of this specific node and uh, if we want to find uh, the score here in the table how we can do that 
how can we do that we can first we need to find the table and then the body of the table and then the third row probably if we want this element here hmm? so we could find uh, uh, the table is uh, the document dot uh, get uh, element by tag name the tag name is table and they only want the first one so i have the table element from the table i want to find the, the third row uh, so i can uh, first find the, the table rows is uh, just the from the table i am asking the table to give me all the tr elements hmm, for example or maybe the tr elements in the body so uh, the, in the table body not the title one so maybe i can use the get query selector query selector with the selector of uh, t body tr Uh, get query selector the syntax is uh, just query selector there's no there's no get uh, query selector with a lowercase q hmm. and uh, sorry query selector all this gave, this gave me only just one row i want more than one i want all of them so I have four elements, one, two, three, four. You see that these are only the rows inside the body. In general, we have five rows, one, two, three, four, and five, but only the first inside the body were returned because it was clever enough to mark this as a table header and these other ones to the table body. So I could change the score, find the cell corresponding to this score here uh by uh rows uh, element three will be the row containing my data here uh, if you click here it will highlight it and so i can find the td inside get element elements by class name for example no 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 that, that by tag name TD, uh, the third one, no, the zero one, this, the first one, the first one will me, give me a TD that if I inspect it, I will find the text property, inner text property, where is that, uh, is 30. So I could change this property. For example, so I can take this element here and change the property in our text to 30 and, 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 uh, and load. And we'll change, I'm changing a property of an element and immediate, immediately the page is updated. So from this code, we can navigate through the DOM, finding whatever we want. Of course, it's, uh, it's difficult huh? because at this point, uh, uh, we should remember that how many rows that we have, uh, th these rows are instead of inside, um, inside the table and so on. It would have been much easier if the TR would have uh, an ID. If I could mark these rows with a unique ID, ID exam 1, ID exam 2, ID exam 3, or maybe with the code of the exam, then it will be much easier to find them later. So we will learn that we, we, when we generate the HTML, we will probably generate a lot of more classes or IDs to make elements easier to find in HTML without relying on the knowledge, the fine knowledge of the structure of the page. But you can mix uh, all these selectors and try to navigate and find what you want. And once you have an element, you can modify their properties. Hmm? So this is the basic working 
of these uh, kind of uh, finding elements in the DOM. Um, we can also, once we have the reference to a given node, we can also navigate uh, to the neighboring nodes. Uh, the nodes before, the node after, so there are a lot of uh, uh, attributes uh, uh, giving a node, uh, finding the parent node, finding the previous and next uh, sibling, so the, the other children of the same parent, uh, or its own children. Hmm? Uh, if you want to, for example, when we add the rows of the page, uh, rows here, that was a node list, uh, we, ca we, we, f we, we, we found the, the, the sorry, the rows uh, is a list of rows. If I take the third row, it's a TR. I could also immediately check the children, the child nodes of this row, which are a not list, a list of nodes from which I can extract or navigate all, one by one all the nodes. You see that there are some text nodes that correspond to the white space, basically. The space before and uh, uh, across this, this MDTD, the, which is the, the new lines, basically, that we have in the HTML code. Uh, in many cases, we want to ignore the text elements. Uh, so instead of navigating with these attributes, uh, there are other sets of attributes that are called uh, not parent node, but parent element, not child nodes, but children, and all this, uh, and similarly, and uh, uh, these elements are ignoring text elements. So it will be, will, be, will be much easier just to ask for the children, children with the N, that will give, you, uh, give me an array, a node list array of three table data. So from because these TD are directly nested inside, inside the TR, inside the TR, and so on. And uh, uh, if I want to ask uh, which, who is the parent uh, element uh, of uh, of a given row, it will tell me that the parent is the T body, and so on. So it can move from node to node, uh, following the topology of the of the tree. Uh, upwards with the parent, uh, downwards with the children, and sidewards with the previous and next uh, siblings. And if you want to include or not uh, the text nodes, uh, you will use uh, this set of attributes or that other, other set of attributes. Once we have an into a node, uh, we uh, can um, modify, read and modify all the attributes uh, of this DOM node. And the nice part is that all the attributes that you already know from the uh, HTML attributes, they are in, uh, mapped one to one with the properties, uh, with the JavaScript properties of that object, the object corresponding to that. So if uh, an element has an ID, then we can have the ID attribute on that, on the reference to that, uh, on the JavaScript object referencing that element. If an input has a checked attribute, you can find the checked attributes there and so on. So you can read every attribute on the page directly uh, because, for example, uh, we saw that this row three, uh, the four, the trial nodes uh, three, for example, is a table data. If I open this element, just pick one, uh, I see a lot of attributes. Uh, and uh, some of them are the class names, some of them uh, are the, there will be also an ID. In this case, it's empty because we didn't set an ID on the uh, HTML code. Mm -hmm. We have an inner text, which is the text that is contained and so on. And uh, uh, so all the attributes that you could define in the HTML, you find them here in the DOM as attributes of the DOM. Uh, in particular, you can query or set or remove or change every attribute using this set of methods uh, for, for the given element. So if you change it, whether the attribute is present, you can get the value. You don't need the get attribute really because you just have to, you can just access that with, with a dot notation. Or you can change an attribute uh, value. Usually attributes are read-only. If, if you want to change them, you need to call this method and not just modifying the attribute uh, yourself. Um, okay, uh, the next step, uh, so we can read everything. How 
we can modify the attributes and how can we modify the structure of the of the tree if we wanted to add one exam for example uh, how can we do that uh, well the there are two methods for creating new nodes uh, to be inserted in the tree there's a create element and a create text node because basically we have two types of nodes which are elements and texts create elements uh, accept uh, uh, the name of a tag that we want to create create text node uh, will accept only the um, the inner text uh, that we want to to enter so uh, let's imagine that we want to in our case to add some text here in this box on the right here so we can write some code to get a reference to this uh, uh, box and uh, add a new paragraph there okay so first uh, so instead of working on the table which is more complex and we already did something let's try to work on this box first uh, where is this box how can i identify that so in this case uh, it's a box which uh, where i put an id of comments hmm? so it was uh, clever enough to put an id on this element so it will be easy to find a box uh, like uh, with a uh, uh, document dot get element by id with the comments right so the box is actually b o x our comment box and we want to add the paragraph inside this box so i create a new paragraph let a new paragraph will be a new element document dot create element create element of type p i want it to be a paragraph and uh, um, i want to add a text inside this element so let text is a new text node document dot create text node containing uh, i'm here i'm alive for example okay there's a comma there's a I'm, ah okay i forgot the backslash here no come on can i do it okay so we have these two nodes which is the um the uh, new paragraph and the text node text uh, i see it uh, is a text node and the new paragraph uh, new paragraph is a p they are not linked together so i might i'm i should first uh, insert the text uh, inside the p and then insert this p inside the box and there is a method called uh, add children uh let me show it here in the slide uh, sorry append child which uh, i will add one new child to a given parent so i will append new para append child with the text and then i will uh, insert the new paragraph inside the box so i will take the box so it's called box dot append child new paragraph and when i hit enter the new paragraph will appear there okay so i modify i created uh, some nodes and they are created in a disconnected way later i can connect the portion of the dom that i just created into an existing dom and when and only if it's reachable from the document uh, root element it will become visible for everybody so it will become visible on the page um, and uh, this object uh, the object i created is alive in the page really and, and so we can modify this object and find uh, other uh, or uh, modify it further if, if you want hmm? so there are different many methods uh, 
for uh, inserting new elements for creating new elements uh, we saw the append child we can uh, be if we know the parent but if we know uh, the, the sibling uh, we can uh, insert it before or after a given sibling so besides uh, a, an, ex an existing element uh, or there are a lot of new uh, methods uh, which are more um, useful or easy to use than the append one uh, there are just append prepend before after and replace uh, uh, that will in this picture we see where where the object will be appended so if you have a node for example the ol node you can add a new node before the element before the starting tag after the closing tag or before the first children the child the first child or after the last child uh, with that already is, are possibly existing children of these elements um, these four single nodes uh, you can also do something more let's say uh, direct uh, easier in some cases uh, because if i need to add for example one line containing many items uh, you need to uh, create every single text node every single span every single div every single p and so on and put them together there's also a shortcut uh, every element has an inner html attribute and this attribute uh, will contain all the HTML code inside an element. For example, we add uh, our rows uh, and so on. Dot inner, uh, wrong, sorry, it's, uh, it's an array, so I need to get one element. Zero dot inner HTML. The inner HTML gives me all the code which is inside this row. Hmm? Textually like uh, you see all the spaces there um, this code this attribute sorry can be overwritten so you can uh, change this as a string and uh, uh, modify it as you want so for example i take the string uh, let me see if it works and they can modify web application one into web application three and I modify the date uh, into the 1st of April because it's a joke. And so what I'm doing is actually destroying this rule, this row, sorry, and creating a, a new one which is made of several, not just one element. There's one TD, another TD, a text element, and so on. So I hope it works. No, it doesn't because I need a backslash here. Uh, because otherwise he will not understand the multi-line string okay and so you see that i recreated the content of the first row from scratch right now the the structure is the same it's always uh, td 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 but maybe anything else hmm? and so i'm really recreating the row so sometimes it's easier just it's easier just to uh, add uh, some uh, html code and let the browser parse the html code and create the nodes instead of creating the nodes ourselves and again uh, there are other methods like insert uh, for inserting html uh, in before in uh, the beginning at the end and so on of the code where the difference is that uh, in the first method we saw the uh, parameters are the nodes you need to create a node and then you can append a node otherwise here you can just append or insert an HTML fragment and the node will be created automatically by the browser so it's a quick way of creating any HTML fragment or just an, ele uh, an element or just the text inside an element and so on and so there are quick ways uh, uh, to create a content without creating manually each and every of the nodes there's also another way of creating content, uh, which is cloning something that is already existing. So if you want to add one row to the table, for example, you can create the row with tr, td, 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 or just to take one row, clone it, make a copy, modify the content, and append the new row to the table. So in that case, you can just have a sort of a one prototype, one part of the page that you want to copy and replicate many times. You have two, two the clone node methods, uh, also support the shallow copy so only cloning the first elements uh, or a deep copy where uh, all the recursively sub children are also copied so these uh, uh, are quick uh, quick methods for 
uh, evolving the content of the page. Of course, uh, among all the attributes that we have, uh, we, a special place is taken by the styling attributes, by the attributes that govern uh, the CSS appearance, the CSS style of our uh, elements. And uh, uh, we have an attribute which is called class name. It's not called class. So the class attribute in HTML in JavaScript is, is mapped as class name, which is the only exception where the name in the, of, the, of an attribute in HTML differs from the name of the JavaScript property. The reason is very easy uh, because a class, class is a reserved word in JavaScript, so they, they needed to, uh, to, change, uh, um, to change the definition. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, um, the page, uh, so the, the list of attributes can be, um, the list of classes can be changed very easily. We have a class attribute, the class name attribute, sorry, that contains all the classes of a given element. So for example, we have the, our box uh, class name gives us the string we containing all the classes of the box, but the same information is also available as a list, uh, which is uh, easier hmm, uh, to, to manage because you can add, remove, uh, search inside this list uh, of strings instead of having one just space separated list and uh, um, we have methods for for managing this class list like uh, sort of array methods adding removing and especially toggling uh, an attribute so we can add an attribute if it's not there or we can uh, remove it if it's there so we can uh, just uh, uh, switch on and off uh, some uh, specific behavior or some specific uh, um, layout structure of the element and on the other hand, if we need uh, to have more control over the style of an element, so not just selecting a class or a set of classes, we could control also every single uh, CSS property. Uh, we have a, um, a property in, uh, in the DOM called style, and style has a lot of sub-properties that match uh, each of uh, the individual CSS pro uh, declaration properties. So, uh, for example, uh, we may see that uh, uh, if we want to see the tr uh, dot document document dot get element by id for example comments which is our div dot style uh, is a, a long list and is an object that contains uh, uh, a lot of uh, property which is in uh, in this moment is uh, empty because we didn't have apply any property to it uh, but uh, if we want to see the expanded object and see the possible possible values where well, the s uh, that that this object will support uh, uh, you see that uh, uh, the, the, the inspector will show you all the default values for all the attributes. Uh, many of them are uh, specific uh, for uh, each browser, but many of them are also all, um, the, something that we re uh, recognize uh, being uh, all the CSS uh, attributes uh, uh, that we learned uh, in the CSS uh, lectures. Uh, you see all of them are here. So if you want to change uh, one of them, uh, you can do that uh, directly by manipulating uh, uh, the, the style attributes uh, of, uh, for, for example, style uh, dot uh, color uh, equal to uh, it was uh, uh, black, so we make we can make it red. F F zero 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 R G P yeah, and you see that uh, the style is immediately changed. So this is effect. Uh, changing the style attributes of a, of a DOM node has exactly the same effect uh, as uh, um, putting an inline style into the element. Mm. So at that point, if we check the style property, we see that now we have one uh, an, an object containing one property. So the style property, uh, when you query it, it only gives you the property that you explicitly set. The inspector you know, does, does you the favor of showing all the possible values. If you really want to see all the possible values, uh, you can get the computed styles that uh, puts together the default style plus the CSS uh, applied plus the, um, the style that you um, applied uh, manually. 
so we have these two levels uh, of control one is controlling the classes and one controlling the individual css property of each and every single element uh, that you have uh, in your dom so uh, i will stop uh, the this part of the lecture uh, right now and uh, so that the next uh, part uh, will uh, deal about uh, the uh, the dynamic part so how actually uh, to modify the behavior of, of the page uh, by uh, learning how to handle the events. Hmm? So the second part will start with this new topic.